You're watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Is your name today? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. Let me read a quick verse and then you can be seated. Proverbs 29 and verse number 11. A fool vents all his feelings, but a wise man holds them back. Smile at your neighbor and say, my God, this is for you. You may be seated. Amen. We welcome all of our friends and guests here today. Uh, this is our life class where for about 30 minutes uh, we try to look at the word of the Lord in a practical manner in which we can apply it to the common problems and circumstances of our life. And we know, uh, we take as a theme for this class where Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life and you might have life more abundantly. Uh, I want to entitle this today, My Dear Enemy. My Dear Enemy. Uh, the reason why I use that title is because self-control and self-discipline is the subject whereby we find ourselves at war with ourselves. See, I can kill the spirit on Sunday morning. <laughs> um, as long as we're talking about principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and high places, my God. As long as we're talking about that, it, it, we have an other. You see, we have an other, and we get to point a finger at an other. It's the enemy. It is a demon. It is a worker of iniquity. It is an unbeliever. It's an atheist. It's et cetera, et cetera. We always get to have us, that is the good guys, and then the other, that is the bad guys. But then there is this problem of self-discipline, self control where we do not get to blame anyone else for the piece of pie we had last night. We were at war with ourselves. And our enemy is, of course, us. And oh, how we love ourselves. In fact, when Jesus wanted to inspire us to love others, he could think of nothing more motivating than to say, love others as you love yourself. So in self-control and issues of self-control, uh, we are our own dear enemy. Uh, I, I heard a funny joke because all of us know circumstances that drive people we love crazy. You know how to push the buttons of people you love. Uh, once you get to know them well, you know pretty much how you can push them to the very edge of their self-control with minimal effort. Uh, <clears throat> and... You know who you are. So, uh, father passed by his son's bedroom one day coming home from work. And he was astonished to see the bedroom was completely made up. Everything picked up. The bed tightly made. On the, <clears throat> excuse me, on the uh, bed was a letter propped up on the pillow and it was addressed dad. Well, his heart was filled with worry and fear because this did not happen on a regular basis. And so he opened the letter and it said, dear dad. It is with great regret and sorrow that I'm writing to you. Um, I've had, I have decided to elope with a new girlfriend that you have not yet met. I wanted to avoid a scene with mom, but the truth is I found real passion with my new older girlfriend. She's so nice. I know you would not approve of her because of all of her piercings, tattoos, and her membership in a motorcycle club. <laughs> Also, she is much older than I am. But, Dad, it's not only our passion together. She is pregnant. And um, she tells me we will be very happy together. She owns a trailer in the woods, has a stack of firewood for the whole winter. We share a dream of having many more children. She has opened my eyes to many things, and I now see life so differently. Uh, don't worry, Dad. I know I'm just 15, but I know how to take care of myself. Someday we'll come back to visit you so you can get to know your many grandchildren. Love your son, Joshua. <clears throat> P.S. Dad, none of the above is true. I'm over at Jason's house. <laughs> I just wanted to remind you that there are worse things in life than the school report card that's on the kitchen table. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank God our kids are next door so they don't get any ideas. <clears throat> Self-control is such a huge part of maturity. And more than just adult maturity, it's such a huge part of spiritual and Christian maturity. Uh, children are adorable. Children have no self-control. It's fine at their stage. It's no longer adorable if you are an adult with no self self-control. Um, we find many ways to rationalize our lack of self-discipline as we get older. We become experts at creating the narrative whereby we justify a series of bad decisions we made and it is somebody else's fault. And it makes perfect sense uh, after we tell ourselves the story. But the truth is at the, the, the truth is, time has its own way of weighing our decisions. And whatever our opinion is, uh, time usually will vote on whether or not our decisions are consistently toward the good or consistently toward, toward the bad. Uh, it is very important if we're going to be leaders of anyone, if we are going to be examples to anyone, if we're going to be spiritually, spiritual guides to anyone, it is very important that we have um, a, a quite serious commitment to self-discipline and self-control in, <clears throat> in our life. Uh, the lack of these things is uh, very much a reminder of those who are children, uh, not those who are strong. Um, in Isaiah, the prophet rebukes the children of Israel, and he calls their leaders capricious children. Uh, in other words, uh, he, he rebukes the nation and he points out that uh, it's a curse on the nation that the leaders are like capricious children. They have no sense of self-discipline. They have no sense of control in the same manner that a child cannot resist the urge, the impulse, cannot in some way uh, temper their desires. Uh, when leaders are that way, it becomes a terrible weight upon everyone who depends upon their wisdom. Uh, there's been a lot of research into the uh, attributes that denote future success. And uh, there's a whole literature on this. You guys have heard me talk about it several times. I won't bore, with you, bore you with it very long, but let me just remind you of this. I've already taught this before. Um, but one of the most um, indicative uh, signs of future success in a child. It's not necessarily academic. There are some uh, correlation there. They cannot find much causation there. There is some relation, relationship to uh, background, to genetic inheritance, to all of these things, but causation is hard to ferret out. Uh, correlation is easy to see. Um, but one thing that they have found, and there's a several books out on this, if you, can, if you can see in a young person the ability to defer their desires. And they do tests like this. You can have one cookie now, or you can have three cookies in five minutes. Children who cannot wait for five minutes in order to get three, three cookies uh, have much lower levels of future success and achievement than a child who begins to learn at a young age how to calculate. There's a better advantage to waiting five minutes for three cookies than there is to having one cookie right now. Now, I don't know how much this can help us as parents. I play little games like this with my son. Um, I just do it because I'm a nerd and I'm into that kind of a thing and he has to suffer. I mean, I had to suffer. You know what I'm saying? It's his turn. So, um... Uh, I don't know if there's much guide there for parenting, but it is an interesting re reality for us to understand. One of the most important future tells of success is the ability to discipline the self, to control the self, to postpone gratification. Um, the first time self-control explicitly is mentioned in the New Testament is Paul preaching uh, to Felix and his wife Drusilla. Uh, they were Jewish and uh, or, or Drusilla was Jewish, and uh, they had a rather uh, ugly history. Um, uh, Drusilla had uh, had had not appreciated Paul's preaching because he discussed righteousness, self-control, and coming judgment. Now, uh, her uh, uh, excuse me, Drusilla, she had. Uh, been married young and she divorced quite 
to the rumor mill of the time. She divorced her first husband, a king of a small region in Syria, so she could marry uh, Felix, who also divorced his second wife, so he could marry Drusilla. Um, and so it was third marriage for him, second marriage for her. She was now 20. They had done it with much public scandal. And so to have Paul stand in front of them and preach of... <laughs> self-control and uh, righteousness and judgment to come was to them very much an obvious affront to uh, the gossip mill that was going around to them. That's the first about them. That's the first time self-control is mentioned in the word of the Lord. But uh, the principle is shown not or in the New Testament, I should say. The principle, however, is shown consistently, Genesis to Revelation. Some of the greatest stories uh, that are narratives, that are teaching narratives to us, um, are stories like Samson, a man of great anointing and power. A man of great anointing and power. His greatness did not save him. His talent did not save him. His abilities did not save him. Save him because his dear enemy always found a way to win. His inability to control himself, his inability to discipline himself and choose the right was more than a match for his great strength and his great power. He could strangle a lion, but he could not control himself. He could burn the crops of a nation, but he could not control himself. And his destruction came not because anybody uh, out overpowered him. It's beca- it came because he had an inability to control his self. And over and over in the scripture, this instruction is clear. And I confess and I admit to live with a goal of self control and self discipline is to often feel at war with yourself. It gets exhausting uh, to feel like you are at war with yourselves. A lot of us uh, can be quite judgmental of people who are um, addicted to something. We can be quite judgmental of people who are addicted to drugs or uh, judgmental of people who are addicted to cigarettes or alcohol. Uh, And the truth is most of us struggle with cheesecake. I mean, to be fair, uh, and let's be honest, kicking a serious addiction is way harder than kicking a cheesecake addiction. But look at me. I haven't solved my cheesecake addiction yet. It is a battle, it is a struggle, and it is cumulative. In other words, one bad decision compounds upon another and compounds on another, and you finally get to a point where coming to your senses, and I pray we all would, coming to your senses, you realize, and the only way you can make sense of anything is to say, I didn't get to where I am in a day. This is a long slide of bad decisions, and for me to climb back up is not going to happen in a day. I'm going to have to turn this ship and slowly start making good decisions over time. And so, uh, let me read a passage, 1 Thessalonians 4. I'm, I'm choosing some random um, translations of the Scripture uh, intentionally. And I, I do this because um, it makes you hear it fresh. It's like walking into a house with new eyes. It's like if you've been away from your house for a while, you come back, you're like, My, why haven't I fixed that yet? Because you quit seeing it. You, got, you watched it with, you know, you understand what I mean by old eyes. You see it with new eyes. When you would go to a new translation... It'll force you to see it with new eyes. And so let me read. Finally then, this is First Thessalonians 4. Finally then, brothers and sisters, we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received instructions from us about how you must live and please God, um, that you do so more and more. For you know what commands we gave you f- through the Lord Jesus. For this is God's will. For you to become holy. For you to keep away from sexual immorality. For each of you to know how to take a wife for himself in a holiness and honor. Not in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God. In this manner no one should violate the rights of his brother or take advantage of himself. Because the Lord is the avenger in all these cases. Because the Lord is the avenger in all these cases. As we also told you you earlier and warned you solemnly the Lord did not call us to impurity but to holiness consequently the one who rejects this is not rejecting human authority but God who gave his who gives his Holy Spirit to you now on the topic of brotherly love you have no need for anyone to write for you for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another 
And indeed, you are practicing it toward all the brothers and sisters in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. To aspire to lead a quiet life and attend your own business and work with your hands as we commanded you. In this way, you will live a decent life before outsiders and not be in need. Pretty good advice, right? You see, this is no, there, there's no angelic choir. <laughs> this is just the battle with your dear enemy. <laughs> this is not manifestations of the seventh heaven. This is not glorious winds blowing from the east. No, this is just good decisions over time. Self-discipline. Your flesh doesn't always want. Your flesh doesn't always desire. But Self-control gives us a strength that almost nothing else can destroy and take away. It's not about attaining a perfection. Uh, no one in the history of the universe until the life of Jesus Christ attained any perfection. Uh, it's by His wounds that we are healed. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. And so it's not about perfection. It is about that choice to honor God through the testimony of your life. And furthermore, it is a manner in which you bless yourself and you bless everyone who is under your care and in your hand. The life of one who has self-discipline is a blessed life. You don't need an angelic choir. The blessing has already been given. Uh, the wise man says in another place, that a man who was not in control of his spirit is like a city without walls. Now, uh, this is not... This doesn't ring so clear to us because we don't think in terms of security through walls. Uh, but in the time of the Old Testament, walls were pretty much the number one defensive technology of the day. Uh, some cities had it, some cities didn't. If you did not have it, you had no protection from any banditry that just might sweep nomadic through the area. You literally could not control what would come in and what would come out and you could not keep what you possessed. It was open. You were a city without walls. So is a person who cannot control their, their spirit. Uh, and the problem of lust and the desires of the flesh, uh, they start in the flesh but they do not simply have their uh, soul expression in the flesh. Eventually, they have a spiritual expression. And although it was a transgression of the flesh, it does not stay that way. And, at time, and eventually it becomes a sin against the people you love. Initially it is, but I'm talking about in the sense of pain and suffering. And finally, it produces a spiritual consequence within our hearts. Ephesians 4. So I say this and insist in the Lord that you no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their hearts because they are callous they have given themselves over to indecency for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness these desires in our heart and in our life they are of the flesh and they resonate with the world and if we get our philosophies from the world and if our largest influence is the world if you you, uh, one of my, let me just, uh, just confess to a serious, a serious irritant. Uh, most people get their philosophy from the most recent movie they've seen. Seriously. Um, that's where they get their philosophy of, from. And it drives me nuts. Because it bleeds into all of society's methods whereby we tell each other what to think. Whether or not it is reporting, whether or not it is newspaper, whether or not it is blog entries, you will find whatever the latest pop movie is, whether it's a Disney movie or just a regular uh, adult movie, uh, that philosophy seeps into the culture and people start repeating it one to another as though they have a systematic manner of living. And they say these little amorphisms, which is a, just a, a, like a, a cliche. And, and they think they've thought about it. And just speaking personally, it drives me nuts. And my wife has suffered much for me having to express myself, saying, that is the most ridiculous, you can't live that way. It's absurd. But it's popular. 
Okay? There is a spirit of the age. That's generational. All, that sin's not new. And if people, I know we, I know preachers, we get up here and we say, you know, evil men, seducers, whack, and worse and worse. That, and, and, and I'm not saying that's not true. It is true. But the principle of sin's not n- true. And the transgression of sin is not true. And, uh, not, excuse me, not true. I'm saying not new. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> the Word of God is new. I mean, true. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the sin is not new, and so the church the church is not in, intimidated by sin at all and, and just because we act pure that doesn 't mean that we 're simple okay we We mostly get it uh, we, we, we mostly understand in fact, the public transgressions of say the Roman Empire are much more lascivious than than ours than ours today as far as a public uh, expectancy. Uh, or a cultural expectation, I should say. Uh, but the point is that there is beyond just the transgression of sin, there's a spirit of the age whereby a whole generation, without thinking about it, agrees to a certain worldview. And then they reinforce one another with that. Now, if that is in line with the Word of God, it has a certain value. If it's not in line with the Word of God, it has a certain negative influence. We are trying to be Christians. Can I have a big amen? Uh, We don't want to have whatever the latest philosophy is of some popular culture. Whether it's a record, whether it's a movie, whether it's a novel, whether it's some celebrity show. I don't care. That is not who we're trying to be. And we need to have the self-discipline to recognize when our world influences that we're getting from the spirit of the age is influencing us away from the word of God that is forever settled in heaven. Uh, so, uh, these issues of self-control are a continual battle. I'm going to try to give you, at the end, a few things you can think about, um, as I often do in our life class, just trying to give some uh, practical uh, ideas that you might think about, and I need to skip to that right now. So, let me just go, just throw those out, and uh, I'll skip the section on the consequences of a life without self-discipline. How about that? I'm going to skip means and basis for self-control and those pages right there too. So, sorry. Uh, So let's say we buy in and we understand that the struggle for self-control is, it's, it's a battle with oneself. It's the dear enemy. There's a part of us that we can see ourselves living a certain way with a certain discipline. And then there's reality. And the dichotomy, the separation between those two really is just uh, immensely frustration, frustrating. I'll never forget, uh, I, I, I keep a, not so much a journal as just kind of a collection of random thoughts. And uh, I'll never forget sometime in my, uh, I believe it was, I was 38, 39, I wrote a, an entry in one of my journals where um, I, I rebuked myself, because uh, c- you don't get to read it, trust me. And um, I, I just said, uh, you know, I thought in my 20s that a day would come when I would have won against my uh, challenges of personality. I thought that when I got to my 30s that I would have a different set of problems. I wouldn't have the same set of problems. And it is so frustrating. Uh, I didn't use that word, but I won't tell you what word I used. It is so frustrating to wake up nearly 40 years old and see all my problems gathered around me like old familiar friends. The same things. I, I thought at this stage of life I would have won. Now, I do believe there is a general progression for the person who makes effort over time. Uh, but the truth is, it's only one slip away, and you slip right back into that habit. And um, we, 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 we buy into this need for self-control, but man, the, the reality of it, the relentlessness of it, the Chinese torture, you know, where there's one drop of water, I don't know, that's like a, a myth or something. I, they just drop one drop of water for, for like ever, and then eventually it's like more painful than a baseball bat. I don't know. You get the idea. The sheer Chinese torture of self-discipline. 
and self-control. I want to have biscuits and bacon with gravy every morning. I do not want oatmeal. It's of the devil. I want to eat steak five times a week. This once a week business is of the devil. Now, I can do all of that, but you guys know the problems that happen over time. Uh, it's exhausting. So, if I were going to try to give myself, I, I, I despair of giving you ideas. So, let me just give myself some ideas in this subject. Uh, I don't feel hyper uh, competent in this subject. I, I feel like that I should have an altar call right now, and then I should say, follow me. Uh, self-control and the battles of self-discipline is ever with us. And so, uh, a, few, a few things to give myself. Um, and the first one would be this. In fighting these battles of self-discipline and self-control, um, it's, it's important to start with baby steps, not giant leaps. Uh, no process happens overnight. Habits are not formed in a day. Uh, muscles do not grow strong in a week. It takes time. It takes time. And you must have momentum. Momentum is so important. You, you, you can't have this continual uh, defeat, success defeat. You need some momentum to keep you on track. So if you start with a small goal, you can have a little success. And that will give you a little momentum and momentum is huge because if you ever get to discipline fatigue you won't just slide back one step you will slide all the way to the bottom of the mountain and so I want to keep myself from getting just just exhausted disgusted with my efforts because when I'm in that emotional state I don't just slide down a little bit it's like a skier I wreck at the top of the mountain and I don't stop sliding until I get to the bottom and then it's a long walk all the way back up to retrieve my skis and so uh, start with baby steps it's more important for you to set an attainable goal and have success than it is for you to set a grand goal that might be a lifelong project and think and expect yourself to go zero to sixty overnight so I need to think about baby steps and I want to build uh, upon that I want to build success upon success if I can start by cutting uh, behavior to to four days a week rather than six days a week. If I just can start with setting a goal for a one or two days a week rather than, than, than trying to go just cold turkey. This is just me, personality types. I don't want to just do this for a few weeks. Uh, things that are cold turkey, like when you go on a cold turkey diet, that's not real. You're not going to live the rest of your life that way. It's just not real. You need a nutrition plan that you can look at and say, realistically, I can do that the rest of my life. So like for me, I try to live like a believer five days a week, and then two days a week I party like a heathen. <laughs> that works for me and my food problem. I can live with it. I can do that the rest of my life. So five days a week I try to eat pretty healthy, and Saturday and Sunday, ain't no grave going to hold my belly down. <laughs> Figure out what motivates you. Figure out. We're all motivated by different things. Figure it out. Figure it out. Take some time. Figure out your motivations. Figure out your triggers. Because your ability to be self-disciplined or self-controlled exists between your motivations and your triggers. And it's like a ping pong that's going back then. If you can understand both sides, most of us understand one side. We understand our motivations and we don't think about our triggers. Uh, we understand our triggers. We don't think about our motivations. If you can try to balance both sides, that which propels you forward and that which drives drags you back. I want to be healthy. I want to be healthy. I want to be healthy. Ooh, cheesecake, cheesecake, cheesecake. You get the idea. Try to understand both ends of them, uh, and that will help you not just say no, but understand when you're at risk. Think in terms of routines and habits. Uh, if if you can develop a good habit, it's a blessing to you the whole of your life. Uh, if you can get a, a routine, it is a consistent, systematic addition to your life. 
Um, and so rather than thinking in terms of short-term sprints, think in terms of long-term routines, long-term habits. That's what I tell myself when I'm in battle with my dear enemy. Uh, Self-denial is uh, something that is uh, a practice. Um, it's not a performance. It is a practice. And uh, practice means you're always striving. Uh, it's, you know, we say you practice medicine, you don't perform medicine because everybody's different. And the doctor's trying to figure out how to apply this large data set of learned uh, knowledge and whatever to you. And you are an individual and all this is a big data set. So it's a practice. They're always trying to get that right. So it is with our lives in this battle with ourselves, um, we, 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 we practice. And so setbacks should not break us. It is a practice. It is over time. This will keep you from falling all the way to the bottom of, of the mountain. Uh, so it is a practice of self-discipline. And, and you're going to be better at it sometimes than others. Anybody who is involved in any, any performance uh, thing they know you have off days and you can't figure out and other days you, you you know after you get done say you're a sports guy and you get done playing a sport and you, you get done and you walk off and you're like I may not be good but I'm not that bad I mean I was like way below uh, and other times you walk off and you're like man I, I'm not that good I just had a hot hand today so it is uh, with this battle there there's going to be some times in your life you're just not doing good and you can't give up just because you had a rough few days you you have to find a way to return to your motivations, your values, and why you're trying to do it and try to get back into the daily work, the daily grind. Uh, the next thing, and I'm almost done, just a couple things here. Um, seek inspiration for your self-control and your self-discipline. Uh, try to find people who have uh, manifested that in your, uh, in your life through... Uh, uh, reading about maybe biographies or autobiographies. Uh, uh, try, try to find people who have done it because if you always can, can, can look at them, sometimes it helps. In fact, uh, one of the great Roman Stoic philosophers, I'll remember his name in just a minute, um, he, he wrote a uh, uh, Cicero. Uh, he, he wrote uh, letters to his godson, a book. Uh, I can't remember the name of it. Maybe it will come to me in a minute. And, um, and he advised his godson in this way. Uh, he said, uh, find yourself a, a hero um, that you, you can get to know even if at a distance. Uh, and read everything you can about him. Um, and then... After you've read everything you can and you kind of feel like you know them, the kind of person they were, um, then whenever you're facing something serious where you have to make a decision or you're going into a period of risk or uh, some dilemma, uh, sit down and have an imaginary conversation. I know it sounds crazy, okay? Sit down and have an imaginary conversation with this person that you admire and ask them what do they think about your problems and the, your attitudes and how you're handling it. He said it will force you to get out of that, that closed-in thinking where you're always seeing through uh, subjective uh, per perception. It will make you to see bigger picture. Because the truth is, the very problem that you're letting defeat you, that great man or woman of history say, uh, they would laugh at your problem. They face so much more difficult than you did. And, uh, they would, and they would tell you to get back up and quit feeling sorry for yourself and get back in the fight. And that's exactly what you need to hear. Now, I, I don't know how we would exactly apply Cicero's advice to his godson. Um, I, I know it's, uh, we, we have a daily, hopefully daily discipline of prayer. And this is very much a similar function in getting you out of your subjective viewpoint where you're trapped uh, in your inability to see beyond your needs and wants in a moment. Um, I, I, I think that in a strange way, almost a psychological way, shows you one of the benefits of having a discipline of prayer in your life to get you out 
of that. Now, um, it's pretty tough to have an imaginary conversation with Jesus Christ. Let's just be honest. That's a, I don't know, that almost seems like a mental health issue. <laughs> um, we have a lot right here. We can go to the Word of God. Amen? Uh, now, if you wanted to find someone you admired and put, your, put them in your shoes, how they would handle it, I'm sure there would maybe be some good to come out of that, but I think we should, we should have, uh, take it all, take that uh, with not too fine a um, or focused an application and take it, take it just in the intent he meant it, simply as a way of getting out of our small world. Uh, and finally, uh, visualize the rewards of your discipline and self-control. Don't just visualize the cost. You see, we're experts at visualizing the cost, but very few of us consistently visualize the rewards. Does that make sense? That cheesecake just sits in front of me saying, right here I am. But I don't think about, you know, the reward of being the kind of person I want to be who's... uh, And I'm just using that as a silly example. But the benefits of these things, it will build self-confidence. Self-discipline will build self-confidence. Self-discipline will make you more productive. Self-discipline will get you out of the roller coaster of emotional distress that so many people are trapped in. Self-discipline is the benefit to you of better health, better finances, better career, better career opportunities. You will, most importantly, become a witness of the kind of person that you can be through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. And you won't have to tell your children because your life will have shown them. And your children may not listen to what you say, but I promise you they see everything you do. Let's all stand. So, after church, quizzers are selling chocolate dipped pretzels out front. (laughs) And it's Sunday. God bless you all. Take a moment. Greet one another. We're going to start a worship service here in just a moment. Uh, God bless you. Thank you for watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Come worship with us.